uh, early years were um, spent in Ohio in farming country, very much like um, your country here. And my grandmother was a quilt maker, and she was the person who inspired me to make quilts. I thought when I um, became a young mother that that's something mothers were supposed to do. And um, so I made my first quilt with her guidance. But I, although she made quilts that were for beds, mm -hmm. I never quite got that. Um, <laughs> that rule in my head, and I began making quilts as, as expression. And this whole body of work is also about my love as a young girl for paper dolls. They were my favorite toys of anything to play with, and um, I was disappointed when my daughter was born and she had absolutely no interest in paper dolls. <laughs> and so um, I made my first paper doll quilt just you know, it, as a, a, a statement about how wonderful I thought they were. And um, a number of years later, Phyllis George Brown came to Kentucky as First Lady of Kentucky. And she, of course, had been Miss America, and she'd been a newspaper, I mean, a newscaster on TV, and she had a lot of other roles in her life. And when she got to Kentucky, she looked around at the craft and art of Kentucky, uh, uh, most particularly the folk art. And she fell in love with craft in Kentucky and did a great many things to support the artists and craftspeople of Kentucky. One of the things she did was write books about them. And she, when she put me in the second book that she wrote, I told her how grateful I was to have my work included, but I wondered why she didn't own any of my quilts. <laughs> <laughs> and so she and I talked about a quilt that I might make for her. And I told her that I had this idea that I would love to tell a woman's story through garment that she had worn for special occasions in her life. And Phyllis seemed to be someone who had a lot of those moments in her life that I could actually record through garment. And so I made the first paper doll quilt for her. And that led me to think about women that I really did admire. And um, that's how this body of work came to be. It took me six and a half years to make these quilts. They're all done by hand. Um, the applique is by hand, the um, quilting is by hand, because that's the way I felt most comfortable working at that time. I, I don't have anything against anybody who does anything on the machine. I think that machine work is just as beautiful as hand work. It's just a different skill. Starting off with my first lady, and, and the museum has hung them in order, which doesn't matter to me, but since they're in order, we'll talk about how each one of them came to be. Um, I didn't know when, I, I knew I wanted to do 12 women. I didn't know who those 12 women were to begin with, but um, Ella, Ella, Ella Fitzgerald came to me first because I have a son who is a jazz musician. And um, before he became interested in jazz, I had absolutely no interest in big band music. That was the music of my parents' generation. It was terribly boring. It wasn't, you know, I'm the Beatles generation. Mm -hmm. And um, I didn't even, I mean, I knew who Ella Fitzgerald was, but I didn't know anything about her. But when your son becomes interested in something, you look at things in a new light. And um, so he made me listen to the, the era of the big bands. And I became very interested in Ella Fitzgerald because of her beauty beautiful voice. But then her story was um, caught me too because Ella Fitzgerald was basically a juvenile delinquent um, who was living on the streets of New York City and um, had been in an orphanage, uh, uh, not an orphanage so much as a um, house for wayward girls. And um, at the time that she was living there in Harlem, the Apollo Opera House, which I mean the Harlem Opera House, which we know is the Apollo today, had um, amateur nights, which they still do. And Ella was a dancer. She thought she could really, really dance. And she and her girlfriend went to the Harlem Opera House with the idea on amateur night of doing a dance routine. But when they got there, the act that preceded them was a dance act that the crowd absolutely loved. And the Harlem Opera House crowd, if they loved you, they loved you to death. And if they hated you, there was no doubt about that either. And so after this dance act, 
she was scared to death to go out there and she told her girlfriend i'm sorry i i've lost my nerve i can't do that they are they those people really know how to dance i can't dance like that and her girlfriend said well all right ella i i guess i'm a little nervous too and i understand but you know we're here why don't you go out there and sing and she did <laughs> And the crowd loved her, and that was the beginning for Ella. And so she, that uh, appearance is commemorated with these posters that are on her quilt, um, the first one being the Harlem Opera House. And then, of course, she went on to um, her first job was with Chick Webb and his band that played at the Savoy, where there were two stages, and the dancing never stopped. And um, she was the girl singer who he thought was really too ugly to hire, but he did anyway. Um, after World War II, Norman Gantz organized groups of jazz musicians, American jazz musicians, to go to Europe because the, the craze, the American craze for jazz was um, appreciated over there too. And so Ella went with him, and that's this outfit right here. Duke Ellington, of course, one of our best known and beloved composers, loved Ella's voice and um, did a whole concert uh, for Ella called Portrait of Ella that they performed at Carnegie Hall. And the last piece is about um, an appreciation for Ella in 1954 when she'd been 20 years in the business. Um, Ella is, of course, pictured on the bottom of the quilt. She was one of the first women who ever fronted a big band, and she did that at the death of Chick Webb because she wanted that band to keep going on. And so she actually has um, bandstands with her initials on them because she was the leader of the band. Uh, my son was the technical director on this quilt because <laughs> um, these quilts are all designed ahead of time and I had this big picture on my wall of where every little piece was going to go and he came in my studio one day, looked at it and said, Mom, if you put the drummer there or the piano player there, they will never be able to hear what the trumpet player is playing over here. So he made me change my design around. <laughs> Jean Ritchie may be someone that you may not know in Iowa. I don't know. I wanted to be sure that there would be a Kentuckian in my uh, group of women, and Jean Ritchie is um, an ultimate Kentucky woman. She was raised in the mountains of eastern Kentucky. She's the 13th child in her family, and she grew up in a time when um, there was no radio or television or anything coming into the mountains. So the culture of the mountains stayed very pure. And her family was a storytelling music family. And um, the, she being the youngest child, she was always terrorized by the stories of her older brothers and sisters. And her quilt um, is meant to depict the mountains. Um, the, the spaces in between the music lines are the mountains, done in um, what they call in Kentucky string quilting, where you put together strips of fabric and you and essentially create fabric by just sewing small strips of fabric together. Um, I don't know if you do that out here. Um, you call it string quilting here, too? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, the lines in, of music in between are from songs that she actually um, saved, because she's really more of a song saver than a song, although she did write a lot of songs herself, too. but. She's really spent her whole life preserving the music that was handed down to her um, as a child. And she even went over to um, Scotland and Ireland, where this music is really from, to begin with, and researched the origins of this music. She was married to, uh, she, she uh, got a teaching degree from the University of Kentucky, and her first job was in Greenwich Village. And there's a photograph of her um, right here. Um, teaching a class in uh, Greenwich Village. So she was there during the um, revival of the folk, mu folk music um, genre. She sang with, you know, Pete Seeger and, and um, Bob Dylan, and, and they all treasured her because she had the authentic mountain voice that they were just sort of trying to create or copy. She was the real thing. Um, she's still alive today. She's one of the two women who are still living that I um, have done in the quilt. Her husband was a photographer, so that's why um, there are so many photo photographs on this quilt. She um, is living in uh, Long Island. Her, her house looks just like Kentucky, but it's in Long Island. <laughs> and um, 
she loaned me these photographs and the only thing she asked me to put on the quilt was, were the dulcimers that are in the four corners of the quilt because that's her her uh, favorite music our favorite instrument um, I I chose the songs carefully um, based on her biography her autobiography and how, what how, what these songs meant to her as a child and I did I, I have to say that she's the only one that is a child is portrayed as a child and I did that because she, her life revolved around her whole life revolved around what she learned as a child in her community in the mountains of eastern Kentucky and um, I like to point out to children how important it is to pay attention to your grandparents and your parents and the tradition that they um, have to offer you because it's rich and um, this is a girl who paid attention to her heritage and, and preserved it for the rest of us. Um, I love it that the, the, the um, top line is Voices of Loved Ones, Songs of the Past, and the bottom line is And Through Eternity I'll Sing On. And I hope she does. When I was uh, a young girl and was asked to read to read a, a book and make a book report about um, someone's biography, I chose Babe Diedrichsen. And I thought it was pretty cool that Babe Diedrichsen never in her life held a job that was not connected with sports. And she was a woman who um, lived in an era when most women were uh, wearing aprons and, and staying at home and raising children, and they were not professional athletes. So she really chose a path that was uh, pioneering for women. She um, was born and raised in Texas, Beaumont, Texas, and um, she um, was a gifted high school athlete. And her first job was with the um, with a Texas casualty insurance company. They did they hired her for the secretarial pool, but she had no secretarial skills at all. What they really wanted was somebody to play on their basketball team. <laughs> <laughs> and so that's this costume right here with her basketball. They were the cyclones. Um, and she tried lots of sports throughout her life. She was gifted as a uh, hurdler and. Uh, sprinter and so she actually was a, a, a track star and went to the, the 1936 Olympics where she won two gold medals one was or 1932 Olympics I'm sorry one was for the javelin throwing that big long pole and the other was for hurdles when she uh, returned from that experience she you know knocked around and tried to find ways to make money as a woman athlete and one of the things she did was join the house of david baseball team they were a very odd group of baseball players they were barnstormers and they were um men all men she was the only woman on the team and these men all had long beards they were very odd looking <laughs> And she found them to be really odd, too. They hired her to pitch for them. And she would not travel with the, with the boys. She would just show up where the game was, pitch the game, and then move on because they were too weird for her. But that's the um, House of David outfit up there. Um, of course, the sport that she's best known for is golf because that's where she found that a woman could actually make a living in um, the sports arena. And she and a number of her friends organized the LPGA, which is with us today still. Um, she was the first American woman to win the British Women's Open, and that's the big trophy in the middle of the quilt. And um, then the, the Western Women's Open trophy is over here in the corner, and that's the first um, LPGA um, trophy that um, was awarded. Her portrait is on the quilt. She um, died of cancer, but she was a tireless worker for the Cancer Society um, before her death. And so that's why the caduceus is on the quilt, and she was an excellent harmonica player. <laughs> So her quilt is a still life um, overlooking uh, a golf course um, and showing many of the trophies that are um, so important to an athlete. Uh, very interested in women who were um, influential in the field of art and um, 
although Martha Graham was not a visual artist, what I discovered about her was that she was very interested in visual art. And um, she was a contemporary of Vasily Kandinsky. So Kandinsky was an abstract expressionist, one of those first painters that started painting things that didn't look like anything. And um, when Martha saw the work of Kandinsky, she felt immediately that there was a connection between what he was trying to do visually with line and color and shape and what she was trying to do with movement. And so this quilt is um, meant to look like a Kandinsky painting. And um, inside the little shapes are costumes from Martha's um, choreography that she um, mounted all of her life. Margaret, um, I mean Martha, lived a good long life and um, was actually dancing still on stage at the age of 75. Um, each one of these costumes uh, is from a dance, and the dances, uh, many more than are represented with the costumes, are actually on the outer uh, border of the quilt. The um, title of Acrobat of God um, at the bottom, that's the name she gave to her dancers. She called them all Acrobats of God, which I think is a very beautiful um, way to think about a dancer. Some of these costumes are, um, we think about her, they're sort of the archetypes of her, like this gray costume down here is the dance she did where she didn't stand up at all. She sat down and just moved her body. And I mean, she was creating a new style of dance. Before her, everyone was doing ballet and very classical styles of dance. And she created this new dance form that we call modern dance. The costume right here in the center of the dance, of, of the quilt, is from a dance that she titled Clytemnestra. Many of her dances were about archetypal women. And Clytemnestra was a Greek heroine or a Greek character who died a really, really bloody, awful, gory death. And um, this red cape that she's surrounded with ends up just strewn all over the stage as the blood of Clytemnestra as she's killed. And uh, Martha did dance that on stage at the age of 75. All these women are 20th century women, uh, without including Eleanor Roosevelt, because she's such a, um, a strong um, advocate of, of women's rights and human rights. And um, I chose to do her quilt um, with the newspaper as the um, tie-in, because her life, that was the popular medium of her day. She didn't um, have any television in her life, even really, until later on in her life. But everything was reported through the papers. And I was having a really difficult time finding newsprint fabric. I went to all the quilt shops I knew, and I went online, and I couldn't find it anywhere. And so I was mentioning it to a friend, and, and she said, well, you know, I've always wanted a silkscreen newsprint. And I said, well, you do it and I'll buy it. <laughs> and so uh, my friends did the um, newsprint, but the mastheads and the headlines were things that I did on my computer. And I've used a lot of Xerox transfer in these quilts. Those of you who are interested in, in the um, technical stuff about these quilts. Um, of course, all the photographs are newsprint, but the, uh, the, the um, posters on the Ella quilt, those are uh, transfers. Um, the words on this quilt, those are all transfers. And um, I, I do that by um, using a Xerox machine, of course, and having it put onto a, a special paper and then transferring that off onto fabric. Um, Eleanor is the only one who has hats. Well, I think Lucille Ball might have a couple, but she's mostly, she has a hat for everything because you never saw Eleanor without a hat. And I had to um, put those on as part of her, um, her garments. Um, we start out with her as a schoolgirl. She, she was um, the daughter, of course, of very wealthy people. And so her comings and goings were reported, even though she, at, you know, at the time she was going off to school, she wasn't really anybody except in the social pages. And so it was reported that she went to uh, France to school, to a finishing school. She came back home and married her cousin Franklin. And that's the wedding dress. And as the wife of a young politician, 
uh, one of the first things she did was to um, join the League of Women Voters and get involved in um, politics and, and getting people to vote. But her favorite job in her whole life was as a school teacher when she ran the Todd Hunter School in New York. And that's um, what this outfit is about. Of course, um, Franklin's election, <laughs> following her Hoover, um, put an end to her aspirations to be a school teacher or a school principal, and she became a first lady. And this is um, the outfit she wore uh, on parade day on the first inaugural day. And then she really became uh, Franklin's eyes and ears. And um, the, the brown outfit over here commemorates the um, trip she took during the Depression to West Virginia to um, go down into the coal mines and see the conditions in which the miners were living and working. Um, on the bottom, which it's hard, I know, for a lot of you to see, um, the, the first um, newspaper over here features um, her column that she wrote almost every day of her life after she uh, came into office, which was called My Day. And she just talked to the American people about things that she thought they should be interested in and should be aware of and should have more information about. And she continued that through uh, most of her public life. Then during World War II, she uh, felt that it was necessary that someone from the administration uh, go to the South Pacific and see what was happening there. And she uh, was heartily discouraged by all the men in Washington who thought it was far too dangerous a place for a woman to go. But she donned the Red Cross uniform and went to the South Pacific to review the troops. And then her final uh, job in public life was as the only female representative um, to the United Nations, and she uh, was there as um, a human relations um, capacity. And over here we have Louise Nevelson. Now, um, she is the visual artist of my uh, group of women, and I chose her because uh, she is a sculptress, and it was long thought that only men could make sculpture. But Louise said, no, why? <laughs> that doesn't make any sense. We, we women can do anything that you men can do. And um, so she began a career as a sculptress. And um, I loved her sculptures because they reminded me so much of folk art. She, um, and this, this is meant to look like one of her sculptures. And what she did very often, in her, especially in her early uh, career, was to create, to collect scraps from wood yards. Um, scraps of, of banisters and um, any kinds of wooden scraps that she could find. And she would also uh, collect wooden boxes. And then she would create these assemblages in boxes with, with the scraps, pile the boxes up on top of each other, and paint everything one color. And they were either all black or white or gold. I don't know. Is there a Louise Nevelson in Iowa anywhere? <laughs> Anybody know? I bet you there is somewhere. Um, she was also an extremely um, interesting character. She was a, a Russian, uh, her, her Russian background um, in her family, she was American, but she came from Russian stock, and she was a beautiful woman. As she aged, she began to fade, like we all do. And her response to that, she didn't like it a bit, was just to add another layer of eyelashes. <laughs> so she had eyelashes out, big black, thick eyelashes out to here by the time she was in her 70s. <laughs> but it was her look, it was hers. <laughs> Um, and she was one of the first women to dress in ethnic costume, to look at the clothing of ethnic, um, of people of, of different cultures around the world and adopt their clothing. So um, that there are lots of um, re um, references to that way of dressing. She also loved designers, clothing designers, and she would court them and um, get them to design clothes for her um, for favors. Oh. And Skazi was her favorite designer. And um, this black outfit here is one that Skazi designed for her for um, one of her exhibits at the Whitney in New York. 
there are a lot, if you look at this quilt carefully, there are lots of little uh, quotes that um, she uh, made throughout her life. And um, one of them is about her clothing. And I see if I can find it. Oh, here it is. I feel the clothes that I have worn all my life have been uh, a stamp of freedom because I have never conformed to what is being worn. <laughs> Um, she also called New York City the world's greatest collage, which I love. Oh, I like that. <laughs> Lucille Ball was, of course, a pioneer in the field of television. Um, she and her husband, Desi. And this quilt is designed to look like a collage from the 50s. This is my childhood. This is my girlhood. And so these are the things that are most nostalgic to me. Um, actually, I started out with a totally different design for this quilt in mind. And I was given a um, scholarship to go to an artist community to where you can go and work and not answer the phone. And not, you know, you just go there and concentrate on your work. And it was a two week residency. And I went there with my plan and my fabrics, and I, I knew what I was doing. And after the first week of work, I looked at what I'd done, and I just thought it was the ugliest thing I'd ever done in my life. And it just was not working. It wasn't going in the right way. Um, this was in Indiana that I got this um, residency. And on the weekend between the two weeks, my husband came to visit me. And um, my husband is a great train buff, and so there was a... Uh, passenger, um, you know, what do you call it? tourist train in this town, and he wanted to go ride the train. And I said, okay. And there were lots of antique shops in this town, too. And, and so while we were waiting for the train, I said, well, I'm going to go in these antique shops and, you know, shopping opportunity. And um, I began finding things that looked like the 50s to me. Um, I found that pink apron and um, the, the red and white check tablecloth and this red tablecloth with the um, border around it. This little piece down here with the uh, grapevine on it, a little piece of embroidery. And suddenly it came to me that this needed to be a collage of these actual items that were a part of that era. And um, I, I like this quilt a lot now, and you're so lucky that I didn't do that. <laughs> the idea, I didn't go where I thought I was going. Um, there's lots of Xerox transfer on this quilt, too, because I made little posters of um, things like the movie poster from the Long Long Trailer and the TV guide that had Ricky when the baby was born. Um, Lucy uh, was the quintessential, what we thought quintessential, uh, 50s wife and mother. And, you know, wearing her pearls around the house, just like your mother did, right? <laughs> um, so here she is in her TV persona as the, uh, the wife. But this outfit right here, the brown outfit with the cello, is really um, the first persona that she created with her uh, then-to-be husband, Desi. And um, th their routine was that he would, you know, be conducting his band, and then this character would come out and want to join the band. But the person couldn't really play anything, you know, it's just a comedy routine. And so that's referring to their first um, collaboration. The wedding dress is right here, of course, with um, Babalu next to it. And, um, I was watching a, a, a show, like a countdown of all the most favorite Lucille Ball episodes one time after I had this quilt made, and I got the first top three on the quilt, which are, of course, the candy-making episode, which is over here, and the Vitamina Vegemin, and the Grape Stomping. So those three were the, the three episodes that I chose to commemorate. Um, she was a pioneering woman because she was the first woman who was allowed to be pregnant on TV, even though we weren't allowed to say that word. <laughs> and um, she was also one of the first uh, women CEOs of a corporation, and that was Desi Lu. At the uh, after she and divorced, um, she became head of Desi Lu. And so this is her with her gavel as chairman of the board. 
Um, I don't know if I made it clear or if you all know that these clothes are attached with Velcro to the quilt so that you can actually play paper dolls with these quilts. And that was the whole um, idea of you know, my paper doll heritage from, from a little girl, that you could actually manipulate these quilts. And that's why these things are here, so that you're not tempted <laughs> to um, play with the quilts. Rachel Carson, who was such a, a great environmentalist and really one of the first environmentalists. Um, she began to believe that um, our use of insecticides and pesticides was harming our, the food chain. And she really worked hard to get those um, poisons out of our um, food chain. I, I chose her quilt to look like the title of her first book, which was called The Sea Around Us. And so she is pictured, uh, or the, the quilt is a, the earth in the center, surrounded by the border that, that um, is supposed to resemble the um, shoreline. And then the sea is the um, final outer border. And Rachel, um, was one, of, was one of the first women to ever take the civil service exam and to get a job um, with the federal government um, in a, a, a capacity. She, she worked for the Department of Fisheries as a writer of pamphlets for them. And um, that's, let's see, the first job is right here. Romance Under the Waves was one of her first pamphlets for them. She was an expert on um, the ocean and what was going on uh, with fish. and. Um, at one point, she realized that she was writing about the ocean. And at, that's, at this time, we knew more about space than we knew about the ocean, what was under the ocean. We really didn't have the, um, the, the technology to be able to explore the ocean. And if you went deep sea diving, you had to wear an outfit that looked something like this with a mask that weighed 50 pounds on your, on your head. And at one point, Rachel said, well, I'm writing, doing all this writing about the ocean. I need to go down underneath the ocean. And she donned that outfit. And um, she was a very small woman. And, and it really scared her. And she said, I've done that. I don't have to do that again. I know what it's like down there. And of course, now I think today she probably would have had an easier time doing it. But during that time, it was very hard. She was an avid bird watcher, and that's why there are so many birds on the quilt. And um, she was also very interested in tide pools, and she spent a great deal of her time um, exploring the tide pools around um, the East Coast. <laughs> Two books are noted on here, The Sea Around Us, her first book, and then her most famous book, which was Silent Spring, which was about the use of um, pesticides. So that's our good girl, Rachel. That a pioneer um, of the 60s in the area of government was uh, Barbara Jordan. I liked Barbara Jordan because uh, of her beautiful voice, and I can remember hearing her um, give those speeches, especially during um, the, the um, Carter campaign when she delivered the keynote address. Um, her voice was so beautiful and her words were so beautiful that um, I couldn't make this quilt without including some of those words. And that's why there's this whole section over here of things that I thought were so beautiful that she said or things that were said about her. She was um, another Texan and she went to law school in um, the East, in Boston came back to Texas and ran for the uh, Texas Congress and was elected. And this is, that's what that one is about. Um, and, from, and, and at that point, she met LBJ, and they became good cronies. Barbara was the kind of woman who could hang out with the guys and you know get along and knew how to talk to them. And, and um, she and LBJ, LBJ became very tight. She worked for the... Um, Kennedy campaign as a young woman, a young lawyer, and was a staunch Democrat, obviously, 
um, from you can tell from the, the politicians who are mentioned on this quilt, and was eventually the um, first woman from the South, black woman from the South, uh, elected to the House of Representatives. And she served there on um, the Watergate Committee, and uh, well, because she was in the Judicial Committee, um, she had a great deal of um, influence during that time of Nixon's administration. Um, this was the quilt that I made right after 9-11. And I was doing the research on her, and I just couldn't come up with the image that I wanted to use to describe her life. But then, do you remember how many American flags we saw at that time? Suddenly, the American flag was something that I saw again for the first time. And um, that's why I feel certain that that's why this flag has a, this quilt has an American flag on it. And then, of course, the other flag is the flag of Texas. And uh, one thing, there are a couple of really nice things that were said about her that are on this quilt that I love. Um, Sam Grady of Texas said, getting on the podium with Barbara Jordan is like trying to sing with Marian Anderson. <laughs> And um, Bill Moyers said that it will take an infinite cosmic vista to accommodate a soul this great. What I loved about her was that she worked through the civil rights movement, but she decided that rather than um, protesting and marching and doing the things going in the way of Dr. Martin Luther King, she was going to become part of the system and work from inside the system to affect change. And um, she did a great job of that. When she left office, she uh, became a teacher at the University of Texas in the um, LBGA, I mean LBJ school. And um, she also formed uh, People for the American Way. And she won a presidential award as well. So she, and she did wear a lime green dress when she gave that keynote address. So it was hard to find that lime green fabric. <laughs> Margaret Mead um, was a character that I uh, remember from college when I took my anthropology class, you know, that we all took 101 anthropology. And um, I guess she was titillating because of her um, books about sex in other cultures. Um, so that, you know, she was a woman who stayed with me. And when I began to think about women, I thought about her as being someone very special because before Margaret Mead came along, there were anthropologists, but they were all men. And when men study a culture, what do they study? The men. And they forget about that other half of the population. And Margaret came along, and that was her great contribution to anthropology, was that she began studying women and children in other cultures, too. So um, her quilt is about keeping a journal of all the places that she went. And this fabric that's in the center of the quilt is actually a piece of fabric that my mother brought back to me when she went to Hawaii, probably about 20 years ago. And she brought me back that piece of fabric, thinking that I would cut it up, you know? But I could never cut that piece of fabric. It had that central medallion. What could I do to that fabric that, you know, would make it any better than it already was? And um, I, when I decided to make this quilt, I began going through my fabric stash, looking for pieces that were in this color scheme. And I had totally forgotten that I had that piece of fabric. But finding it was like a treasure. You know, this is perfect for this quilt because it, it is from that same um, culture. So there's Margaret in the middle of her medallion of, of a, 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 a pretty authentic piece of fabric. And um, this quilt has tons of Xerox transfers on it. Um, it starts up here with her years at Barnard as a, a college student in anthropology. That was her, her study. And she worked with and studied under Franz Boas, who was the <coughs> eminent um, anthropologist of, of that era. She had three husbands. And this is the first husband right here. And he was a, um, a, a Clericals, I mean, a clergy, clergyman. That was his um, study. And they didn't last too long. The Ashcan Cats thing was a, um, she and a, several of her friends who lived together in the dorm called themselves the Ashcan Cats. They were just like a little group, a little clique. And um, so that's what that's about. 
Uh, after she graduated, her first trip was to um, Samoa. And she went there alone. She wasn't married at the time. And that was a pretty dangerous part of the world for a young woman unescorted to go. And um, that's when she wrote her, her most scandalous book, which was Coming of Age in Samoa. Um, the people called her Makalita, and um, every one of these quotes, if it has a little word on it that you don't know, it's what the people of that culture called Margaret Mead when she was there. <clears throat> With her next husband, she went to Papua New Guinea, and that's this one right down here. They called her Pia. And um, she began having children draw pictures in that um, culture, and she found that children in that culture were drawing pictures in the same way that children in our culture were drawing pictures. You know where they draw the big cephalopods, they draw the big head with the feet coming out and no body? The arms come out of the head, you know, you've seen those drawings. <laughs> well, kids in our cultures do that. She came back to America and began working for the, um, uh, the Museum of American History in New York City. And she was called the Queen Bee because her office was in the high tower in the building. And she was in charge of the um, Peoples of the South Pacific exhibit. So she collected all the artifacts that um, are part of the, the exhibits there. And then she married her third husband and had a daughter. And this daughter is very important to us because um, before Margaret Mead, um, and, and by the way, Dr. Spock was the pediatrician for Chook. That's what she called her little girl. That was the uh, nickname, Chook. And um, before Margaret Mead, Dr. Spock advocated bottle feeding. So that was the way an American baby should be fed. That was the best way to get nutrition. That was the way to do it. Well, Margaret Mead had been all, in all these other cultures around the world where breastfeeding was the way that you took care of a baby. And so she said, I think I want to try this way. <clears throat> and Dr. Spock, in watching Margaret Mead and her baby, and the way they fed and bonded and everything, became an advocate of breastfeeding. Now, do you think Dr. Spock ever gave Margaret Mead credit? <laughs> <laughs> no, that was just something that came out of his head one day. <laughs> so we have to thank Margaret Mead for that. Um, she went back to New Guinea with her husband, who was also an anthropologist. Uh, his name was Bateman and wrote another book. And they also went to Bali, where they did a, a great photographic study of the people of Bali. And the last uh, outfit down here is of Margaret Mead as the older woman. And she was, uh, at that point, going from college campus to college campus, holding seats at the anthropology department and lecturing all over the country about um, anthropology. And she was... You know, she was the doyen. She was the, um, the one with the knowledge. I felt that I needed to include an American Native, uh, in Native American in my body of work. And that was, this was the hardest one woman for me to come up with. Oh, thank you. <laughs> um, because I, I couldn't decide who the Native American woman would be. And um, I was out with a group of my friends, my quilting friends. We retreat together twice a year. And um, I was talking about my dilemma. And one of my friends looked at me and said, well, why don't you do a potter? And the reason she said that to me is because I'm married to a potter. And I thought, well, duh. So I chose a potter who I thought uh, whose work I was really, really interested in. And this is Lucy Lewis. She's from Acoma Pueblo in uh, New Mexico. She's no longer with us, but um, I loved her work. And I especially loved it that um, she lived on this Pueblo she, uh, called Sky City, way, way, way up high in the air. And um, on the Pueblo that they would discover from time to time shards of pottery made by their ancestors, the Anasazi. And instead of picking up these pieces of broken pottery and looking at them and, and putting them up on a shelf and, you know, having reverence for them, they ground them up and used them as grog in their own pots. And I loved how they, that, to me, that was a way of taking their ancestors and putting their ancestors into their work. And um, her, her work is very, um, 
evocative of the work of her ancestors, but she also had her own style. And I like that about her too, that she took a tradition and she worked within the tradition, but she brought her own sensibilities and her own life into the, uh, the pottery as well. The back of the quilt is meant to represent a design that she would have used on one of her pots. And the um, borders are images from her pottery as well as from the pottery of the Anasazi who um, preceded her. Um, she doesn't have a lot of clothing because there isn't a whole lot to say about her life, but um, I, I love, of course, the, the ethnic clothing that she wore. Um, this is Lucy as a young woman when she would make her pots and then take them down to the train station to the tourists who would pass through New Mexico and at the train stop they would buy pots from her and all the other um, Native Americans who were making their uh, living that way. This is Lucy as a young woman when it was her job to go get water and if you live up high on a mesa there's no water up there except what you collect from the rain and so if, if it's a rain, the rainy season, you don't have to go too far to get your water. But if it's the dry season, you have to go all the way down the, the um, mesa to get to the water source. And you carry the water in these great, beautiful pots that the women made on top of your head. It's very picturesque. Not, not something any of us could probably do. But uh, my most difficult um, clothing to come up with for her was a dance outfit because um, the Pueblo Indians don't allow any photography when they're dancing. And so I was just stymied. I couldn't find a picture anywhere. And so I called the Acoma Cultural Center and, and asked for a picture. And they, I told them what I was doing. And they said, well, do her uh, children know you're doing this? And I thought, oh, gosh, I'm in big trouble now. <laughs> and I said, no. And, and then they gave me the number of her daughter, her phone number. So I called her daughter up, and her daughter was very gracious and helped me out a great deal on this quilt. And um, Lucy was the mother of uh, eight children. And this picture, this cloak, this dress down here is meant to represent how she uh, carried her children uh, in the Pueblo style. And of course, in the center, this is Lucy in old age when she was winning all the prizes for her pottery. I mean, she is a very highly revered potter of um, the, the Southwest, and she's wearing all of her turquoise. And that's real turquoise on there. This was the 12th quilt, and I had planned 12. And I had my, um, I knew the last person was going to be someone literary. And I had my choice. I could either do Pearl or I could do Maya Angelou. Maya Angelou is still living. So I wanted, if it was going to be Maya, I wanted to meet her and let her know that I was doing this so nobody would want to sue me or, you know. <laughs> I was worried about somebody who would sue me over these quilts. And um, she was coming to Louisville to give a... Um, presentation at the um, Center for the Arts. And so I did everything I could to try and meet her. And it didn't work out. I didn't get to meet her. So I said, well, my deal with myself was if I met her, I would do her. If I didn't meet her, I would do Pearl. So I went home, and I started the research on Pearl. And I totally fell in love with Pearl. I just fell in love with her. And um, about halfway through the research, I got an email from Maya's office saying that she was interested and um, she would be delighted if I did a quilt. Well, when you get an email like that, <laughs> what are you going to do? <laughs> so um, I made a 13th quilt because of, um, of that experience. But talking about Pearl first, um, Pearl was someone who um, lived between two cultures and was never really comfortable in either culture. She was the daughter of missionaries to China, and she grew up in China with a Chinese uh, nanny as her caregiver. So she could speak Chinese, she um, had great respect for Chinese culture, and um, at the same time that she was learning about China, her mother was telling her stories about America and the things that America stood for and um, the, the, the um, qualities about America that are, are the qualities that we like to think about ourselves in, you know, that these good things about ourselves. 
um, freedom and all that sort of thing. Well, um, the Boxer Rebellion came along in China and the missionaries had to leave and Pearl came to America. And when she got here, she felt that the things that her mother had told her about America didn't live up to what the experience in America really was. She didn't feel that there was freedom here for everyone, and she didn't feel that everyone's rights were equal here in America. And so she felt let down, that you know, it wasn't, it wasn't true. This fairy tale that she'd been taught was not really true. Um, so her quilt is supposed to sort of split diagonally. So the red part represents her Chinese experience and sensibility, and the green part represents her American um, part. She was, uh, her family was from Pennsylvania, and so the, um, the Pennsylvania Dutch kinds of um, imagery is what I used for the, the silhouettes in the green part. And, and uh, Pennsylvania is where she settled down to when she came back to America. Um, this is her uh, childhood in China, and everything in this quilt is in uh, English and in Chinese, and I got the Chinese from my local Chinese restaurant person. <laughs> I said, these are the words that I want to put on my quilt. Can you put them into Chinese? And she said, oh, that'd be no problem because she's got a computer that writes Chinese. <laughs> so um, th that's why you see words. If you see a word in English, the word next to it is what it would be in Chinese. And up on top, it says Pearl Buck, and that's Pearl, and that's uh, I think this is Pearl Buck, and that says Voice of Humanity, which is um, the super cat I gave her. Um, <clears throat> Pearl had one natural daughter, and she was born mentally retarded. And so she did a great deal to um, improve the conditions in which mentally retarded children were being cared for. And she created a cottage on the um, grounds of the institution where her daughter Carol lived. And she called it Carol's Cottage. And that's where Carol lived with um, several other um, people who were in the institution as well. And, and Carol's Cottage is still um, going today. Um, Pro Bach is the one of the people who taught us about the um, about China and the East. Before Pearl came along, we as Americans really didn't have a great understanding of that part of the world. We thought those were the people that lived on the bottom of the world, walked upside down, and wore triangle hats. We didn't know much about their culture at all. And um, in writing The Good Earth, Pearl helped us to um, understand and appreciate the rich culture um, that is China. And then, of course, she did the same thing for Korea and um, many other um, of the, the countries of that part of the world as well. She and um, her second husband <coughs> published a magazine called Asia. And that's what she's holding in her hand right here. And that was uh, in an attempt to um, explain that part of the world to, to the Western mind. Um, See, this is, um, she was a great supporter of Margaret Sanger because she felt that women should be able to, to do anything they wanted to do and one of the first things they had to work on was birth control because if you're having 10 bajillion babies, you don't have time for anything else. And so she supported Margaret Sanger in her work with Planned Parenthood. This is the Nobel Prize that she won. She was the first woman to win a Nobel Prize and she won it for the Good, the good Earth. Um, I don't think so much for her literary style as for the content of the book and what it uh, meant in, in the world of literature and in the world altogether. Um, Pearl Buck had been discriminated against in China because of her race. And when she came to America, she was very, um, she, she felt that um, she understood how um, African Americans were being made to feel in this country. And so she um, worked very hard on race relations as well and wrote many articles for the NAACP in their magazine, which was called um, Crisis. So that's what this is about. And another one of her great causes was the um, flight of Amerasian children who uh, were born because of the many wars that we fought um, over there in that part of the world. And she created the Pearl S. Buck Foundation, which brought children who um, were not being accepted in their own countries because of their um, American um, half 
to um, America where they were, she, she made sure that they were educated and um, given a life. And she herself actually adopted nine of those children and, and encouraged adoption uh, from many of her friends and anybody else who was interested in adopting uh, children who were um, half American and half Asian. And uh, peace was her other great um, cause. And I loved that all these causes that she fought so diligently for were the causes that those of us who grew up in the 60s were so interested in. But Pearl Buck is the age of my grandmother. You know, so she was so far ahead of her time in um, coming up with um, the things that we really need to care about in life. And um, so that's why I fell in love with her. I've always loved because I, I loved her writing so much. And, and I, I love that she spent so much of her time writing about herself and <laughs> talking about her journey through life so that um, it was accessible to all of us. Um, she, was a very, she was born into poverty, really. She didn't have very much. And she was also a teenage mother. And um, this, that's why the first thing of her is um, herself with her son. She never married the father. I don't know that she's ever named the father. But it didn't matter. She was a great mother anyway. She took on this um, life that came into her. It's a very serious job. And, and um, her relationship with him has been wonderful all of her life. Um, her first job was um, as a cook in a restaurant. She, she had so many names. Her real name is Marguerite Johnson. And when she was a cook, her name was Rita. And she worked at the Creole Cafe. But um, she was much more than that. And um, dancing was one of the things that she really did well. And that helped her in um, creating other opportunities for herself. Um, in the center of the quilt, we see Maya in a Calypso outfit because she had a Calypso uh, nightclub act that she did. But um, Maya also had a stint as a stripper. And now you guys are here, you get to see this. Nobody else gets to see this except the curators. You also get to see how the quilts work that way. <laughs> um, as a dancer, she toured um, Europe as the, the tra in the traveling company for Porgy and Bess as a pr principal dancer. And that's what this um, outfit is about. And um, she worked uh, in the Southern Christian Leadership um, Conference with Dr. Martin Luther King during the Civil Rights Movement. And um, that's what this one is about. And um, she appeared in Roots as Kunta Kinte's grandmother. So she's down here. This is her writing career. And the final outfit is um, giving the um, poem at the um, inauguration of um, Bill Clinton. Her quilt is um, supposed to resemble a G's Bend quilt. Now, I know it's up top. I can't help it. I cannot quilt. I cannot make quilts in that um, loose, wonderful style that the G's Bend ladies have, where you know you just slap things around and it all comes out beautiful. This is an uptight white lady's version <laughs> of a G's Bend quilt. <laughs> um, and it's got lots of um, other references to books, to um, places that, um, performances that she gave. Um, she had a great collection of African masks from her time spent li actually living in Africa. And this little tag up here, which says Marguerite Johnson en route to Mrs. Annie Henderson in Stamps, Arkansas, is what she wore on her, on her wrist when she and her brother were sent from uh, California to Stamps, Arkansas to live with their grandmother. And they were sent alone. And that's how they knew where, where to get off, where they were supposed to be going. Um, I don't, uh, that's my ladies. 